That's the one too. All right. Um, I'm Landon Kessler. I'm a tenor. I love all forms of music, but specifically opera. I'm very into Bach at the moment, um, and a little bit of Vivaldi. Catherine Mesa. I'm from Miami, Florida. I sing Song to the Moon and Por Di Amor. So my name is Gianluca Nagaro. I am a senior in Florida International University, and I play violin. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling really good, you know. We just had a performance about an hour long. We had multiple pieces and it was just all different varieties of just string trios with accompanying solo singers as well as the choir. I'm feeling excited. I'm happy this has been such a beautiful show. It's been such an experience with the FIU and I just love the master classes, the learning and just the techniques. I've been learning so much and I I just I'm so thankful for being here. I was, you know, able to input like everything I learned this week into the pieces and I'm very proud of the outcome. So if you could jump into a time machine and go back to anything you've done this week, what would you go back to? There was an auditions workshop with the head of auditions at Santa Fe Opera Emma as Johnson. Exactly. Yes. I've been struggling with auditions lately, not getting in, but just knowing what to perform, how I feel about them emotionally, and he really opened my eyes to the world of auditions and how abstract it is. It was also fun and amazing and the energy from the audience as well. We had a couple people come up to us be like, we loved listening to you play. We <laughs> loved listening to everything you did when watching you. All those smiles in the audience was just like so heartwarming, especially like as a performer. It's been a very you know, a very intense week, but at the same time, very fun week. We had all the intensity of rehearsals, trying to get everything pitch perfect to, to the amount that we can so that we can have it ready for the performance. We also yeah. went sledding as well yes, in the you snow. Did. On some ice, I think I heard. Yeah, on ice. <laughs> it was not the softest ice at all. Was, I can tell you that for not. sure. <laughs> well, I would want to do my lessons with Amy again. Oh, Amy yes. Owen. Amy Owen. Yes. yes. She's so knowledgeable, and I just, I'm so happy that I was able to have a lesson with her. So. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's your second year with us. It's right? my second year, yeah. yes. I'm starting to feel m more in one with my instrument compared to last year. Last year I was trying to figure things out. I feel like this year, you know, everything is coming together with me and my body and my voice. So I, that's that would be the difference. Yeah. You did such an amazing job. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and um, I hope to see you again soon. I hope to see you too. Thank, Thank you. you. The voices you just heard were part of an arts and culture exchange between high school students in the Young Voices of the Santa Fe Opera Program and college students at Florida International University. This collaboration was just one of the many opera dishes we serve up for our young audience members, artists, and creators from pre-K to, well, it never really ends, does it? So if you have young folks in your life, it's possible that one of these tasty tidbits may be right for them. In this episode, we're continuing our excursion from Opera for All Voices along the winding paths of community engagement at the Santa Fe Opera. And now, you're in for a treat. Acclaimed soprano, originator of the role of Sweet Potato in the Opera for All Voices premiere of Sweet Potato Kicks the Sun, and our new director of the Young Voices of the Santa Fe Opera program, Amy Owens. <laughs> It's season five of Key Change, a podcast that began as a platform to talk about creating new operas through Opera for All Voices. But we didn't stop there. Maybe you found the show because you're an opera fan and supporter of new work. Maybe you're an advocate for social equity and accessibility in the arts. Maybe you're a friend, colleague, or a family member of someone who's been a part of the show. Well, this season is about you. We're expanding the conversation even further with the vision of inspiring the future leaders in opera. I'm Andrea Fellows Feinberg with the Santa Fe Opera. And I'm Anna Garcia with the Santa Fe Opera. On this season of Key Change, we hope that our guests, programs, and stories will spark new discoveries about how you can become part of this movement. Engaging artists and audiences, creators and communities, supporters and superfans to make the world a better place together. We are back in the studio with the new director of Young Voices, Amy Owens. Welcome. Oh, hi. Yes. <laughs> I'm happy to welcome Amy at each and every turn. Welcome, Amy, to Key Change. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yay! <laughs> okay. Off to a good start. <laughs> Amy, our listeners know a little bit about Young Voices because over the years we've been talking about the relationship between Young Voices and Opera for All Voices, but it'd be great for our listeners to hear from you what Young Voices is to you as its newly anointed director. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. The Young Voices program has a beautiful history with the opera. It was founded in 2008 
And a mentor of mine, Kathleen Claussen, was one of the original founders of that program. And so to be able to now steward that program after she's left her position as director is quite an honor and a responsibility. So I'm very grateful to be in this position. The Young Voices program is open to anyone entering ninth through 12th grade. And I think what really strikes me about the Young Voices program is just the quality of the students that are involved. Right now we have 11 students, and they're all highly intelligent, musical, they are curious, they practice, they work really hard. And being able to engage with students one-on-one every single week, which is a big part of the program, gives me a lot of confidence for the future of our nation, of our world, as well as for music. So the program, in essence, right now, is weekly private voice lessons and coachings for students, which the Santa Fe Opera provides for free, which is amazing because that is a huge investment, and not very many students can afford that kind of training when they're in high school. They're also involved in so many other activities, so the fact that they set aside this time for their private musical training is amazing. And then we also meet as a group for studio classes where we do bigger training or we just practice ensemble things. And that's really useful because we do a lot of events in the community. Suddenly it become very popular. We are. We are so popular. We get a lot of requests to do holiday caroling, to perform at the libraries, which we're now doing a lot with Opera Makes Sense, and, and much more than that, too. So I heard two really essential things. One, the kids are all right, which we talk about a lot on Key Change. And two, we value their time. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's one thing that I'm really thinking about and gauging now as my first year as director. What is it like to ask students to engage with serious music study at a high school level? I love to see that we can provide training to a lot of students But I think there's some room to be adaptable so that every student can get education and involvement and a feeling of belonging, performance experience at the level that they're ready to engage with. So it's not you have to be all in in a performance track or no music at all. That's beautiful. What was so special last year as well was that we were able to see Lydia Gradato Gradato on stage, who's a Young Voices alumni. So full circle with what the possibilities for students starting under your wing, essentially, I feel. Yeah, we have some really amazing alumni of this program, people on Broadway, singing professional opera. So they're really talented kids in New Mexico. And I think, why not make this the destination for pre-preparatory programs in the U.S. Also, it happened in less than a generation. Usually it takes a whole, like, 20-year cycle Mm -hmm. before you see that kind of change. And to have a a Young Voice alum as a member of the Apprentice Singer program and in a pretty significant role in her first season in Rosalka is kind of out of the ordinary. How did you feel when Kathleen first approached you? I believe it was first to provide some master classes and voice lessons during the the, the COVID times and the, <laughs> the Zoom times. times. The Zoom times. And then that led mm-hmm. to this ask later. So will you talk about that trajectory and how you felt when Kathleen broached that? Honestly, it feels a bit of a miracle to me <laughs> that this happened the way it did. And it feels much like a right place, right time situation. During the pandemic, I was really interested in creating spaces for people to engage and have intimacy with one another, even when we were feeling, or especially when we were feeling so isolated, and to use music and improvisation and skill building as a way to do that. So I had formed several different workshops. And so Kathleen, being amazing, (laughs) was aware of that and and was curious about it, and I'm grateful that she asked me to do a workshop for the Young Voices Online, where I was able to experiment with my new workshop format. And then I did some private voice lessons online, and then I was in town here in Santa Fe because I just wanted to be here. I was looking for a reason to move here. And thank you to Andrea as well for flagging up this opportunity and this transition time, which 
we weren't sure exactly how it was going to go or when it was going to happen, but I think we all sort of took a leap of faith. And then last season, I was able to act as associate director and get my feet wet, get things running on the ground. And now I'm here as director, and I could not be more grateful. This is this is really my life's mission and my life's work to to think about pipeline, right? Mm-hmm. The pipeline meaning a young person having exposure, being trained, coming back into an organization. And I feel like I'm also the pipeline at work because Santa Fe Opera invested in me as an apprentice when I was first here in 2014. And Kathleen Clausen gave me several of my very first performing professional gigs. So to come back and take the baton, so to speak, and come back to an organization that invested so heavily in me and to be able to give back feels just perfect. It feels in total alignment. So I'm really grateful. That was good. Anybody else got a tear? I'm always the first one to cry. But that's no that's no big secret. <laughs> Me too. But I'm very interested to see what is Amy's beginning as an artist? Where did that start? What sparked you? You asked me this yesterday, so I thought about it. Yes, I did. <laughs> and it's such a good question because upon reflection, I realized more why my values as a teacher are what they are. And they have so much to do with my early experiences as a budding artist, so to speak. So I experienced the idea of flow from a very early age, being very focused and so engaged in the process that time stood still. I was just hours and hours, whether it was practicing the piano or writing or reading. And if someone interrupted me in the middle of that novel, you know, help them. And I have a very specific memory of my grandmother teaching me a tap dance. She was a dancer. She taught me a routine to Yankee Doodle Dandy, (laughs) which I then went into the basement and practiced on my own for over two hours at age seven or eight. Okay, little Amy. (laughs) So you see, I was experiencing flow. I mean, it could have been five and I wouldn't have cared. Then I took my younger sister, taught her the routine, and then we, of course, performed it for the whole family. And to me, that explains a lot about my values now, which are being taught, practicing, engaging with process, teaching someone else, Mm -hmm. and then sharing something fun and exciting with the people around me. And I love the process so much. That is it for me. Performing is just the cherry on top of this beautiful ice cream sundae full of connection, mentorship, And the performing then becomes just about connection. Mm -hmm. And I don't really get nervous when I perform. And I hope that my students can also get better at not being nervous. We all get nervous. But when I'm just thinking about it as this extension of the connection and the process that we've already established over hours or months or years, then it's just a beautiful way to exchange energy with other people. So that tap dance, that was... That was it for me. That was the beginning. That was so eloquently put. So it brings to mind this new kind of middle game I play called What Can't Amy Owens Do? (laughs) Because the tap dancing is new, right? Okay. But I was thinking in relation to, and I knew this about you, but at Opera Makes Sense, which I want us to talk a little bit more about because I don't think our listeners know much about that. Um, When you went over to the piano at Opera Makes Sense this past Saturday and Mm -hmm. just played this little ditty. So let's do that. (laughs) Unpack that. What can Amy Owens do? (laughs) Well, I think because I was a process lover, I've always said the thing that most came naturally to me was just practicing. And anything that involves practice, I could really excel at as a young person, especially in the arts. Sports, you know, for me, that was just more fun. I always said dance Oh, no, there's my a sport. sports Amy Owens, no, too? No, 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 no. It was dance <laughs> okay. for me. And I did compete. I did compete. You know, I did, like, point shoes and mm-hmm. tap dancing. Okay. Tap dancing was my greatest love in dance. I was a serious pianist up through high school and a little bit through grad school, too, Singing, my mother flagged that up as being one of my greatest gifts. Mm, and That is beautiful. Another beautiful moment. <laughs> yeah, she's, she just said, you know, you've got a lot going on. Yeah, I was a pianist. Yeah, I was a dancer. And as an older sibling, I also had a lot of nurturing in me, and I really wanted to be a nurse and just kind of be a healer. 
and I excelled in academically in those areas and the sciences. But for my mother to see all of that and say, hey, singing is actually really special for you. Mm. And I kind of thought, okay, whatever, cool, it's fun. But I was serious with my process as a singer. And then I had a voice teacher in high school who said, hey, you know what, you should audition for the music program because this is special. And I thought, well, sure, fine. (laughs) Two people have now told you. (laughs) Two people told me. And I had no modeling of a career in music, so I didn't consider it because it wasn't in my realm of possibility. I think that's another thing that Young Voices does. It just shows what's possible in music. So I was really lucky because even in college when I was majoring in music, I still didn't think to have a career or to pursue a career until another teacher in college took me to auditions. And then someone in an audition room took a chance on me and hired me. And it just, it was one thing after another. And I feel like Santa Fe is another example of people just seeing things in me maybe that I couldn't totally see, but I know that I can rise up to the challenge and just believing me and giving me the opportunity. And then I get to engage in process. And the next thing for music with me is conducting. Yes. (laughs) And I've been studying conducting seriously for a little over six years now pretty seriously, and I got to conduct the New Mexico Philharmonic last fall. (laughs) Because to me, that's just a deeper level of music making. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out what every instrument is doing. You have to be listening to 50 different lines at once. And to me, that's just thrilling. That's the next level of process. How deep can we go? As a singer, you also, you're an accomplished pop singer. <laughs> I don't know. And you've, you've, you written, you've written songs? Yes. Yeah. So you're also, you also compose. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I that. think. <laughs> I don't know if that's part of my identity, nor am oh, I particularly. Oh, okay. Do we want to put that back away? No, it's well, just Well, now that, it is. I'm going <laughs> to. It's just that these are explorations. Because your voice, you want to use your voice and share a story. And... Yeah, and. I'm curious about the process. And, (laughs) you know, I did this, I'm just going to say kind of pop (laughs) album a handful of years ago where I co-created, co-wrote it with someone and... Co-produced. (laughs) Co-produced. And all of that led to the way that I now approach composition with kids. We do an opera storytellers. Let's talk about that. That was a huge way to do it. So... Sometimes I just engage with it as an experiment, just like the tap dancing, so that I can teach someone else. We can share it and it becomes Mm -hmm. something bigger than Mm -hmm. just one project. Yeah. Yeah. Opera Storytellers is such a cool camp. (laughs) Cool camp for kids. And the Santa Fe Opera has been doing it for a a while. Yes, since 2014, I think. 2014. And I came in. Check my calendar math. (laughs) (laughs) So it's been around and... God, we're talking 10-year anniversary of that program. Another anniversary. (laughs) It's so exciting. We should celebrate everything every day. (laughs) Opera Storytellers, we reformatted it two years ago because it's now a five-day day day camp for kids. And we compose and perform from memory an opera with kids that's about 10 to 12 minutes long. What grade do I have to be in to be a storyteller? You have to be entering third through sixth grade. So you think, how can you do this in five days? I drew on the experiments that I had done, both in my kind of pop album, (laughs) which then became the foundation to the improvisational exercises I did during the, the pandemic with people on Zoom, which then laid a foundation for a very quick and satisfying process for kids where they really amazing. <laughs> well, they know that they're in it mm-hmm. and they have mastery of the content, which are the I think two essential components toward it being fun. It's so fun and the best part is they don't have to have any music experience before they get there. It's They will after. They for sure <laughs> will and the whole idea behind the process that we created is just so that kids can love the process 
and have fun and not worry that they don't have experience or skills. Amy, is your middle initial P? <laughs> Why? Because process. It is P, isn't it? <laughs> it should be. Process. Amy Process <laughs> Owens. I like that. I'm changing my, my name officially now. Trademark. <laughs> but just to confirm for all of our listeners, the performance that happens at the end of the summer camp is as cute as you think it is. <laughs> just, I just want to confirm that. It is the cutest thing you've ever seen. Yeah, and, and the comments, as you, all the children <laughs> yes. talk about their experience after the performance. One of my favorite comments from the very first camp that I did as co-director, someone stood up and said, what I learned from this camp is that it's okay to be weird and expressive <laughs> instead of trying to just be cool and chill. And we all smile and laugh about that, but that's so profound. It's, it's, it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely cried. Embrace. Yeah. <laughs> so you have your hands in a lot of pots with us, but if I'm not mistaken, we have quite a history with you, right? So just to begin with, if we're going to rewind back onto Opera for All Voices, Sweet Potato Kicks the Sun. Is this not the very sweet potato in the room with us right now? The sweet potato, <laughs> which I also have for lunch. Oh, oddly um, enough. <laughs> <laughs> super healthy for you. So, yeah, I was an apprentice in 2014, and then I came back four years after that. And in between, Andrea had hired me for some other community engagement things, like the holiday tour. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is where I first met the young voices of yes. Santa Fe Opera, because they sang with us. And Andrea, you were so wonderful then. I just remember I was stressed and you gave me a spa day. Yes, I did. On my birthday. (laughs) That was an intense time. That was when you were holding the whole, you had the whole concert in your hands. Yeah, it ended up being just me. And I learned an entire 30 minutes extra. Among the things may I be known for is giving people spa days. (laughs) (laughs) Andrea, I I remember that. Talk about artistic moments and I'll just say you can cut this out later. (laughs) But part of the reason I wanted to move to Santa Fe is I looked at the women around here. I looked at you, Andrea, Kathleen, Carmen, and I said, I want to grow up to be like them, so I need to be around them. We're going to cry again, you guys. (laughs) This is the Have Your Tissue Handy episode. (laughs) (laughs) So I've had other opportunities to come back. Kathleen Clausen gave me my very first Carmina Burana. She recommended me for that with the New Mexico Philharmonic after my first apprentice year. So I kept coming back to Santa Fe. And then it was thrilling to be a part of the very first commission in the Opera for All Voices program as the title role in Sweet Potato Kicks the Sun. That was such a wonderful time. That was so fun. (laughs) It was bonkers, actually. (laughs) It was bonkers. I felt sort of uniquely qualified Mm -hmm. because the composer, Augusta Reed Thomas, was combining some of this pop flair, improvisation, Absolutely. something I had been experimenting with, into a very complex modern score. We had people that didn't read music in the room because it really, she took that to heart, all voices. So we had Nicole Paris, mm-hmm. a viral beatboxer with just incredible sonic palette yes. on stage with us. And I definitely went all out trying to be a beatboxer, but that is not one of my skills. <laughs> I'll take that one off the list, but I definitely try. I love that. Okay, so now we know what Amy Owens can't yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not hire me to beatbox. Can you talk a little bit about what your encounter with that approach to storytelling and opera, with, what was that like for you? And did that shift any, anything in your way of thinking about our beloved art form? I think being a part of Sweet Potato Kicks the Sun, looking at that score, talking with the composer, talking with the director to create something entirely new gave me a deeper insight into, you guessed it, process. process. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for just we, a we moment. We were not going to make a drinking was... game out of this. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done in my career. Oh, I imagine so. It was 
taxing on every level. And I'm grateful for the chance for me to see what I was capable of and a chance for me to see all those random skills, all those random experiments come together and be useful. And I thought, you know what, if I hadn't studied conducting, I don't know if I could do this. Wow. So that was kind of a nice moment. And then it just reinforced for me the possibilities of our art form. The fact that opera does mean the works. It means that we can include a lot more. And just to know that someone like you, Andrea, had this vision to prioritize this kind of work with the values of inclusivity and integrity and in storytelling gave me a lot of hope that I still carry with me. So when I come across things in the industry that feel maybe a little old or a little stuck, I'm not bogged down by that mm. because I've been filled with experience and hope for what opera could be. And that's what I got from the Opera for All Voices program. And I saw it in the next commission and the next commission. Just how expansive can we be? How many people can we include? Can we just shift the mindset a little bit more to make this better for everyone? And I feel like you've done that. Oh, thank you. I, I believe in the, if you move a battleship one degree, you're going to see a completely different land. And I also have to flag that there's so many people in the DNA of Opera for All Voices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hi, I'm on that list is Brandon Neal, who was with it from the very beginning, and Ruth Knott, and, you know, all, all yeah. our dear friends. But yeah. then you're part of the DNA, too. <laughs> I'm thinking about our youngest audience members. Opera Makes Sense? I'm thinking about Opera Makes Sense and going back and talking about that spectrum of audience engagement Yeah, that comes out of the community engagement department. Yeah, so Opera Makes Sense, as I understand it, has had a bit of an evolution. And it's only recently come underneath the umbrella of the Young Voices program. So I just took that title to heart, that how can we make opera makes sense. Yes. <laughs> not just to little kids, but frankly to everyone, because sometimes we're not sure, <laughs> right? There's perceived barriers. Absolutely. With the amount of education you have to have or the language barriers, which really don't have to be big barriers at all. And in Opera Makes Sense, what we've come to is a distillation of why we even bother telling stories with music. Why not just have a play? Why not just read a story? Well, because music elevates everything. It gets into the heart of emotion. It extends time, extends and deepens any emotional quality that we're feeling. Oh, I loved the way you did that at the library this past Saturday. It was <laughs> so you. great. I was feeling so much emotion through every song. And you're like, how do you feel? I'm like, sad. Now. Yeah, it was a sad story. <laughs> it was a sad story. But that's the point, right? Mm -hmm. We can read and feel a little glimmer of sad, mm -hmm. but then if you add a three-minute sad song with it, then you have an opportunity to really let that emotion sink you in. You take a journey into those yes. feelings, in and out of those feelings, yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes music is more of a soundtrack. It gives you a mood. Even if it's not a deep emotion, it's still a mood. Don't we all have soundtracks in our head all the time? I certainly do. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mine... always on my own TV show. <laughs> Often. Yeah, a little cartoon, like, wee, wee, wee. <laughs> <laughs> little moments all the time, every day. And also giving the kids an opportunity to make music. But I think those youngest audience members, too, we talk a lot about social emotional learning in our work mm -hmm. and what this distance that has come between a person's ability to tap into their emotions, particularly exacerbated by the pandemic. So allowing for that exploration of feeling and normalizing feelings, like big feelings, there's that component that you've now built into Opera Makes Sense that is essential. Thank you for saying that, because that's a realization I had in hindsight. Yep. Or even as it was happening, asking kids to identify emotion. And one thing that I've been learning in my personal study of emotion is that 
our emotional concepts are limited to the language that we have. Absolutely. In different cultures, if they don't have a word for sad, they don't really experience what we consider sad because they don't have that concept. They might experience frustration or boredom. And I'm curious about how we can delve more into that to help children build more specific emotional concepts yeah. because I think that that is something unique that opera can offer mm-hmm. for kids. Amy, this is your first year as director of the Young Voices program. Thus far, is there a special moment you can share with us? Last year, one of our students was really struggling in school and didn't feel that they were a good learner. They had this self-belief that they couldn't succeed in a learning environment. And I saw this student engage with their curiosity through the Young Voices program and through music, where they began to seek out music, records, sheet music, Mm -hmm. stories about composers. And by this season, they were coming in every week with a new piece that they had discovered and learned in entirety. And I thought, well, this person is a wonderful learner. All they needed to have was their curiosity engaged and a supportive environment where they felt they belonged. Mm -hmm. And Young Voices absolutely did it for this student. The student ended up taking their last year of school online and was invited, based on their musicality and their participation in the community, to become a music education major at one of the universities in this state. Wow. it's wonderful. We're going to just dive into this question here. If you could wave a magic wand and anything was possible for the future of arts education, what would you dream of? I dream of a completely collaborative music education process. So often we get siloed, whether it's by geography but most especially our own egos, our own insecurities as teachers, as artists. Because the industry is the way it is, there's a natural competition that can arise, which I reject in totality. And if I could wave a magic wand, (laughs) it would channel everyone's insecurities and need for help into actually leaning on each other. Because as I've gotten to know the musicians and the music educators in this state, in New Mexico, I am completely (laughs) flown away and inspired by the quality of artistry, the quality of pedagogy, and the spirits and the souls that are in all of the arts here. And I truly believe that if we all collaborated especially when it comes to the education of, say, a single young person. Mm -hmm. They might have a choir teacher at school. They might be involved in a community choir, a community theater. They might have musical theater productions, a summer camp, a private instructor in voice, a private instructor in piano, a band teacher. But if all of those people can consider themselves a whole village that works together to bring up and educate a child, then we are absolutely limitless. And I think it's just human nature to start to worry that we're not good enough or that someone's better than us as an artist or as a teacher, that there's a scarcity, that if one person's successful, that we might not be, that there's not enough gigs, that there's not enough students. A lot of comparison. Comparison, competition. We don't need to erase insecurities. That's impossible. But just to create a culture of support that we're all in this together. Music educators and arts administrators and artists are all on the same team, no matter what. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could change the world. So shall it be. 
I think my favorite thing that I learned today was kind of feels like when you're talking about what really sparked you at a young age through, and through high school and people kind of kept, you kept kind of getting pushed towards singing and kind of sounded to me like people usually have to chase their dreams, but the dream has been chasing you for quite some time. Aww. So I just, that's what, that's what I gathered. You yes. Take that clip. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't have said it better myself. So, in a not insubstantial way, I believe that that reversal of process is the reason why I'm successful. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I took the pressure off of the dream, mm-hmm. and it allowed me to have joy. Another pivotal moment in my early professional life was just after my first apprentice year here at Santa Fe, and I was in New York doing the thing. Do tell. And Charles McKay was judging this competition. And I remember I just had lunch with my best friend before I went and sang. I didn't even warm up. I just laughed and laughed with my best friend over lunch for over an hour and then showed up to this competition. Not only was my breath really warm (laughs) at that point, but I had so much joy and playfulness as just an aura Mm -hmm. in me. I didn't really know what the competition was. Someone told me to do it. <laughs> so that yep. was another plus. So yep. I didn't know what the stakes mm-hmm. were. And I ended up winning. And it was a huge competition with a humongous cash prize. I'm thinking Sullivan Foundation. It was the Sullivan Foundation. And it was that perfect example of I didn't know what it was. So I had no pressure on it. Mm-hmm. And I just came in joyfully and playfully. And I sang the best I ever had in my life. I and love that's, that. That's why success really comes, I think, to me. Is because I'm relaxed. When I really try too hard, forget about it. I do not get hired. <laughs> I do not get hired when I try too hard. So those overachievers out there, <laughs> take a note from Amy Owens. Stop trying. <laughs> well, <laughs> the thing is, process. Yeah, the thing is, and I was prepared. Your joy. <laughs> exactly, because I I was really prepared too, because I practiced yeah. every single day. So mm-hmm. by the time I got there, it's no big deal. Yeah. You can't force it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And just when we thought we'd covered everything, our producer Andrea had one last question. So Amy Owens, the burning question that has been on all of our minds for many years now, what is sweet potato? (laughs) Sweet potato is an archetype. It's the trickster character that in this story is completely obnoxious, but also highly intelligent, and through their mischievous doings, exposes the cracks in what otherwise seems like a very idyllic culture. And in the end, is someone who brings people together and creates a more sustainable future, even though at the beginning, all they were doing was just destroying everything. I also consider Sweet Potato to be a cartoon character. Cartoons were definitely the inspiration (laughs) behind my particular interpretation. And some of that came from our director, John de los Santos. And I remember seeing one of the reviews afterwards, and it just made me giggle because it called me (laughs) loose-limbed. And one of the inspirations was... Gumby. Mm-hmm. So, as we were doing earlier with our vocalizations, woo woo woo, Augusta Reed Thomas wrote things like that in the score. And the only oh, did, thing yeah. that makes that make sense is if you have a gesture, a cartoon like action to go with these soundtrack like elements that don't really have a place in the music as texture, but are animating the story sonically. So I just really enjoyed bouncing around. Luckily, I had been practicing yoga a lot, so I think there was a headstand in there and maybe some limbo action. It was fun. Brilliant. (laughs) Even better than I could have hoped for. Okay, good. Next time on Key Change, we'll introduce you to another person in our neighborhood, Marissa Aurora, volunteer liaison, who is also celebrating their one-year anniversary with community engagement at the Santa Fe Opera. Key Change is a production of the Santa Fe Opera in collaboration with Opera for All Voices. We are produced and edited by Andrea Klunder at the Creative Imposter Studios. 
I'm Andrea Fellows Feinberg. And I'm Anna Garcia. Our audio engineer is Cabby at Cabby Sound Studios in Santa Fe. Technical direction by Edwin R. Ruiz. Production support from Alex Riegler. Theme music by Renee Orth. Cover art by Dylan Crouch. Show notes by Lisa Witter. This podcast is made possible due to the generous funding from the Hankins Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and an Opera America Innovation Grant supported by the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation. To learn more, visit us at santafeopera.org forward slash key change. <laughs> so the apple juice is important oh. for, I call it cac. Cac. And you get like, oh. <clears throat> But it's not a nice word, but it was introduced to me by a former press director at the Santa Fe Opera. And no added sugars. Okay. Right? All okay. right. <laughs> Good for you. It's the pH. It, <laughs> apples are the same pH as your saliva. Mm-hmm. See, she knows things. This is just the kind of juicy tidbit we love for keychains. Literally juicy. Juicy. Mmm. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to like apple juice so much. It's been a long time.